Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for, uh, for coming tonight. And uh, we're thinking this fall about Christianity and other religions, and there are a lot of ways to think about that. One is kind of how do we get along with each other? We've been doing that for a few years, and I think making a little progress. Uh, another way to think about it is with this question uh, that I've been intrigued by, uh, which is what's special about Christianity? Uh, if we think about Christianity and other religions, we discover some things that are uh, special about Christianity. And so we're going to be doing some things over the next couple months. My topic for tonight is the Bible and other religions. Uh, now, I was speaking to a minister that I don't know very well uh, the other day, and I told him I was giving this talk, and he said, well, that would take me one minute. And I said, well, I'm slow. It's going to take me a little <laughs> longer than that. I said, what would you do with your one minute? He said, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm like, done. And I'd, I hope it's a little more complex than that and that there's more to be said than that. And uh, I'm going to come back to John 14, 6 at the end of the talk, uh, but I want to talk about a few other things uh, along the way uh, as we think about this topic. Uh, I want to begin back uh, Old Testament times. It's really interesting that the Old Testament was born uh, in a world where there were many gods. Abraham leaves Ur to travel to what's going to be the Promised Land, and he leaves the ziggurats and the gods of Babylon behind. And when he arrives in the Promised Land, there are other gods there. There are Canaanite gods. Uh, the Israelites go down to Egypt. They're Egyptian gods. They escape Egypt, and they wander through the wilderness, and they come back into the Holy Land, and there are more gods foreigners, so a lot of the prophets spend all of their time condemning other gods and the worship of other gods, and it all gets really complicated. So I want to think first about the Old Testament and the gods of their world. I want to talk about the nature of the gods that Israel came up against, uh, and there are, there are hundreds of things we probably could say about them, but I have three in mind in particular. Uh, one is that in all ancient religions, uh, idols were very important. Now, there was no fool who thought, you know, that a golden statue actually was a god or that a wooden figure of a bull was actually a god. They knew that those weren't the gods. Those represented their god. But what's interesting, I think, are the images that were chosen for the gods in the ancient world. Like, they never chose, you know, a parakeet right, or a uh, squirrel or something. The creatures that were chosen to represent God were always powerful, virile creatures like a bull. That connotes strength and virility and power and might and lions and winged fierce creatures or even the sun itself that had a ferocity, a might, a power, the sun. Uh, they always chose uh, strong things. In Israel, uniquely among all religions in the ancient world, God said, you shall have no, you don't make any images of me. God cannot be depicted by any thing, uh, and that was unusual. Uh, even the stars, some of the ancient people thought that the stars were divinities floating around in the sky, but in Israel they said God made the stars. God made all things, therefore things could not accurately represent God. Uh, the story of the Exodus, the uh, Israelites escaping from Egypt, this is a judgment on the gods of Egypt. Because the primary god in Egypt, as it turned out, was the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh said, I am, I am God here on earth. And for him to lose his slave supply, that was a judgment uh, on him as uh, the god. Uh, there's a lot of um, hmm, gentle and sometimes ugly mockery of other gods in the Old Testament. Uh, I love this passage in uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 44, uh, where the prophet says, uh, all who make idols are nothing. The things they delight in do not profit. Who fashions a god or casts an image that is profitable for nothing? Uh, and he goes over here and says, um, he talks about a man who makes an idol. He cuts down cedars or he chooses a tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. Then it becomes fuel for man. He takes part of it and warms himself. He candles a fire. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. He also makes a god and worships it. Saying, how could someone, you take wood and you cook with it and then you turn around and make a god out of it. This isn't a very good uh, religion. Uh, a lot of other humor. If you were at my Jeremiah class a couple of weeks ago, Jeremiah said that uh, worshiping other gods is like being a young camel in heat. That's a flattering image, isn't it? We might not have seen a camel in heat, a young dog in heat, whatever you might uh, choose for that. Uh, the prophet Hosea says that the way we chase after other gods is like committing adultery. He has a wife who commits adultery, says that God's people 
are like that. You have the story of Daniel and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? The, the uh, young men who were in exile in Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar says, bow down to my statue. And they refuse to bow down to that statue. And they're thrown in the furnace and so on. So these gods are represented by idols, and Israel will have none of it. Uh, the second thing about the gods that the Israelites ran into is that these gods were capricious. They were just moody. They just struck whenever they felt like it. So they'd drop a blessing on one person, and they would drop a curse on another person. And there would be a flood on one group of people, and another people, group of people would have, you know, plenteous uh, uh, crops that would come in well. And, and Israel said, God is not capricious. And this is important for us to think about because sometimes we get, in even modern times, we get to talking about the will of God and we imagine God is kind of like those gods that Israel rejected and that the Babylonians worship, that God is capricious. I mean, you'll hear this, that God blesses somebody with all these grand things, and then God drops a car accident on some other family, and God blesses one person with long life, but another person gets struck with cancer. Israel's God is a good God who isn't moody and doesn't strike people. The third thing that's interesting about ancient religion is that, and if you remember taking you know, Old Testament or Bible when you were in college maybe, uh, you have these uh, situations where they talk about the gods of Babylon or the gods of Egypt, and the gods would be sitting up in the heavenly court, and what they would do is they would argue with each other, right? One would say, that Dick Carter, let's just fry him. And another guy would say, oh, no, I like Dick. He's so sweet. He has a nice family. Let's just be merciful to Dick. The other guy would say, well, no, what we should do. They would have a debate among themselves over what to do, and one god would win out the debate. In Israel, there's only one god. And so what happens is that debate gets internalized. And in the Old Testament, very often you see God trying to decide what to do. God, one, one moment, will say the Israelites have really, you know, when they make the golden calf after God's given them the commandments on the mountain. And they make the golden calf, they're having a wild, raucous party, and God says, my rage burns against them. But then God thinks about it and says, but how can I destroy them? I love them. I brought them out of Egypt to save them. So God internalizes this uh, debate. The problem in ancient Israel is what we could call syncretism. If you ask the average Israelite on the street how many gods are there, they'd be puzzled by this question. And if you ask somebody this today, they'd say one. But in ancient times, if you ask people how many gods are there, they'd say uh, plenty. They'd be puzzled you're asking such a thing. The question back then was, how many of those gods are you going to serve? How many of those gods are you going to make sacrifices to? How many of those gods will you go to their temple and pay a tax at that temple? How many gods will you serve? In Israel, they never said there is only one God philosophically, but what they said is you can only worship one. And the worship of only one God is called monolatry. Monolatry. This is actually a uh, useful thing for us is that uh, if we think about, uh, we're monotheists, but we might think about trying to work toward monolatry, uh, because if Martin Luther was right, that your God is whatever your heart clings to, then we actually have a great many gods in our society, and the question is, how many of those are you going to worship? How many of those will really get your allegiance? What really gets your temperature rising? What really makes your day? What ruins your day? Can we grow toward being the kind of people that might worship only this one God. In the Bible, we also see, even in Old Testament times, certain dispositions that are required of the Israelites that might teach us something about how we think about people who believe differently. One is over and over in the Old Testament, it says, when a stranger, a sojourner, a foreigner comes among you, uh, what do you do? You shoot them. No. In the Old Testament, you welcome them, you feed them, you don't ask a lot of questions. If they're hurting, you welcome them into your home. When you glean your field, you leave some on the edges for those who are foreigners. All of those foreigners would have been believers in other gods. So there's a kind of hospitality toward people that believe differently. The book of Proverbs says all these things about, it says a lot of ugly things about people who talk too much. And here I am talking away. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Uh, Pro Proverbs says over and over that the wise person has what? Not a lot of words to say. The wise person has a listening ear. So maybe we're called by God to have a listening ear. 
Uh, we come to New Testament times. Paul arrives in the city of Athens, and he saw, saw some of what we can still see uh, today. He said that the city was full of temples. The city was full of idols. In Acts 17, he says, I perceive that you are very religious. People in Bible times were very religious people. Um, and uh, there were a lot of religions. And what's interesting about it, I, I thought about this in preparation for this, and I asked a couple of scholars to confirm this for me, and I think it's right, is that in, in New Testament times, there were many religions, and the idea of one more religion wouldn't have troubled anybody. There was always room for one more religion, because religions in those days were not exclusive. They were, a new religion would be a supplement instead of an alternative. Until Christianity came along, it had never occurred to anyone, if there was a new religion, that meant that you should reject your old beliefs, you had old beliefs, and there would be a new religion, and you'd believe that stuff too, if you had time to do that. So the, it was an additive kind of religion. It was a roomy kind of religion. It was a tolerant religion. We talk a lot about tolerance in our day. The ancient world was exceedingly tolerant when it came to religion. That's part of what was the problem with Christianity, is that the Christians came along, and they just weren't so tolerant. They were tolerant of people but when, when it came to belief, the Christians were really the first people to stand up and say, there is just one God. There is just one truth about God. Not every belief about God that somebody happens to have will be true. This posed a huge problem for society. Uh, Christianity was the first that demanded a choice. They said you have to dispense with your old beliefs. It's interesting that pagan religion in New Testament times, think how to put this, it was never about conversion. There's not the idea that you were lost and then you would become a religious person and get committed with God and get involved with God. It was never about conversion. Religion in New Testament time, this is interesting, religion in New Testament times was never about character formation. It was not about morals. None of those religions said, if you come to our temple and engage in our sacrifices, we will show you how to be a better person. That's not what religion was about. Judaism was like that, and that's part of why the Jews already were regarded as kind of oddballs in the ancient world, because they said God is all about character formation. God has given us commandments. God wants us to be moral people. God realizes that we are sinful people, and God wants us to turn from our sinful ways. This was not the way they thought in the pagan world. And of course, Christians got uh, confused uh, with uh, Christians got confused with the Jews early on for reasons that we'll get to. So the nature of the gods that, it, that um, the first Christians ran up against, uh, these gods were there because there were things that people wanted and needed. They wanted help with um, disease or war. They wanted their crops to grow. They wanted safe travel. So the gods of the ancient world were people like Asclepius. Asclepius is the god of healing. You notice there's always a snake uh, with Asclepius, maybe you're, uh, what's that thing that, the doctor still have that symbol, you know, it's got the little cross thing, it's got a little snake on it. Isn't that odd? It's like the one thing you'd really want to avoid, it's a symbol of healing, right? Asclepius is the god of healing, so in the religion of Asclepius, God exists so that what? You can be well. Sound familiar? The number one prayer, if someone calls me and says, I have a prayer request, sometimes I start to uh, put money down on it right, is I will make a wager that it is a health-related prayer request, because 19 times out of 20, it is a health-related prayer request, which seemed to exist, that it seems then to be that in our religion, God exists so that we will be healthy, so that we will be well. There are actually a great many things that we might pray about, situation of the world, holiness, uh, lots of things. Um, Ancient religion was big on fortune-telling. Uh, this is a photo of uh, Delphi. You had the Oracle of Delphi, and people would go to temples, and they wanted the god to be able to tell them what the future would hold. So they would know whether to make a journey, whether to purchase that home, whether to embark upon a battle. The gods were supposed to help you to ensure your future so that you could avoid difficulty as you moved into your future. Uh, the gods also existed for... Mm, how should we say it, for wealth and for poverty and even for sexuality. Uh, in the city of Ephesus, uh, which is a really interesting place to visit, 
the primary goddess in Ephesus was Artemis. There's a statue of Artemis that you see there. And Artemis was a goddess of fertility. And that's not just sexual fertility, that's also the Artemis would help your crops to grow. Artemis would help your business to prosper. And the mix of religion and money in those days was really interesting because um, the uh, picture on the right is an artist's rendition of what the temple to Artemis in Ephesus would have looked like. Today, there are just only a few columns that are left there that you can see standing in the ground. The temple of Artemis in Ephesus was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It was not just a temple for the, dead, for the worship of Artemis, it was also the bank. Banks always were in the temples of the pagan gods. I always wonder if, if we don't have some leftovers of this, right? If you go to the bank, they use all this religious terminology, don't they? Like, you know, trust and but this religious language that's kind of hung over, uh, the securities, all these things. Um, so the banks were mixed with religion. Religion was expected to help people to be prosperous. This is a common uh, gospel that's alive and well in the world today. And it actually is interesting in, in uh, Acts chapter 19, when uh, Paul comes to Ephesus, uh, there's a riot that breaks out. And why does a riot break out? Well, the riot breaks out because uh, the silversmiths, whose job was to create little silver figurines of the goddess Artemis, and they sold these and they made good money doing this. When Paul came in and said, religion is not additive, it's not roomy, there's only one true religion. If you worship Jesus Christ, you don't worship Artemis any longer. People in the city stop worshiping Artemis. What do they stop buying? The little silver figurines of the goddess Artemis. Who gets upset about this? The people that make the little silver figurines. So there's a riot in the street. It seems to be about theology, but at the end of the day, it's really about money, which is actually what everything is about in the world now, <laughs> isn't it, as we well know. Uh, the gods of the ancient world were largely um, deployed to bring people not just success, but also pleasure. You have the god Dionysius, and this is the god of revelry and drinking. Like, you know, this is the god of fraternity life at Chapel Hill this Dionysius. Um, and we see this and we think, oh, that's just so strange. But in the ancient world, this was so common. People in their homes, when they would, uh, people who were wealthy would have a nice dining room. They'd bring in an artist to put uh, a mosaic in their dining room, and it all usually would have the god Dionysius because they wanted to drink and have a grand party. And the god would bless that and help them to have uh, a great time. It is interesting to me that these false gods of New Testament times I don't want to get preachy about it, but they so much are about what you and I are trying to get out of life in America. They really represent what the good life in the United States is supposed to be about. And Christianity poses as an alternative to that. Now, um, Christianity does not directly take on the religions of the ancient world except for one. And the only one that it takes on directly is Judaism. And that's an extremely awkward situation, isn't it? Because the first Christians, in fact, were Jews. And if you ask the first Christians, when did you stop being Jewish? They would say, we didn't stop being Jewish. We're very much Jewish. We just believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he died for us and was raised from the dead. We're very Jewish. So it's very awkward the way that plays out in the New Testament. I mean, there's this, there's this mixed message, isn't there? Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, for instance, Jesus sounds very Jewish. And when he talks about the Jewish law, he doesn't, he doesn't say, I came to abolish the law and you don't have to be Jewish anymore. Jesus said, I, I came to fulfill all of that, every bit of it, every jot and tittle of the law. I came to fulfill this. Now, you read the Gospel of John, and clearly by then there's, there's being some tension between Jews and and Christians. And Jews are portrayed as the ones who killed the Savior. And so we wind up with all this stuff that's gone on through history that I'll say a little more about in a few moments. You have the Apostle Paul who's becoming aware that he is a Christian. He regards himself as a Jew, but he's aware that most of his Jewish kinspeople do not in fact believe in Jesus and that a division is coming. Because he says Christianity is not just for Jews, but it's also for Gentiles. But then the Jews over there who haven't accepted Jesus 
It's interesting to read Paul on this in Romans 9, 10, and 11. He is heartbroken. He is puzzled. He's not mad. He's not full of judgment. He grieves that his kinspeople who are Jewish don't see what he sees about Jesus and haven't believed, but he believes that they will. He believes that there is hope for them. He believes that they will come around one day. Um, so that's the one. That's actually not true. I said that's the only religion that the New Testament takes on directly. There's actually a second religion. Uh, that's Judaism. The second religion that the New Testament takes on quite directly and is more important for both them and I think for our purposes is what really was the dominant religion in the New Testament world was Rome. The Roman Empire said, we are God. The Caesar stopped just saying, I'm a political official who's in charge of the Roman Empire. The Caesar started saying, I am God. And they started minting coins like this one that you see here. This is a coin that has, I love this, isn't it? It's an image of the emperor Caesar Augustus. Like, look at his nose. It's just interesting. And uh, what the coin says is that he is Augustus, but he is also Divus, D-I-V-U-S, that means that he's divine. He is the God. And temples were erected in every city of the ancient world. Here are the ruins of one at Pergamum. Pergamum is a really interesting place, by the way. Here's a little aside that this isn't part of the lecture. This is, I throw this in for free, not that you paid for the rest of it. But at per Pergamum is a really interesting place in Turkey, and they have ruins of the temples that were built for the worship of the Caesar there. Pergamum, of course, in the book of Revelation, is portrayed as the most wicked of all cities of the world. A number of years ago, I was invited to preach at a little Methodist church down in South Carolina, and the name of it was the Pergamum United Methodist Church. Like, why did you call your church? Anyway, very strange. So all over the empire, this is what was expected. We, people were to bow down to the emperor. It's a bit of a, a crass, manipulative way to keep political order, isn't it? Right? You want people all over a far-flung empire who believe in lots of different things. You, you want some uniformity throughout the empire. And so what they deemed that it would be is that we shall worship the emperor. He is the be-all and the end all. It's actually why Jesus has a problem when uh, they show him that coin, and Jesus says the thing, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. And we misread that every time we think separation of church and state. No. Jesus is looking at a coin that says that the Caesar is God, and Jesus wants nothing to do with such a coin. He says, give it back to Caesar. I have no part of this. Hmm? who's God and who isn't. So all across the empire, the emperor must be worshipped. The Christians and the Jews were the only people who refused to do this. Because for everybody else, it was fine. One more religion was always fine, worship the emperor. We're happy to do that. We already worship Zeus and Mithras and Pan and a host of other gods. Why not worship the emperor? But the Christians and the Jews were unable to do so because they believed that there was only one God. They weren't tolerant, if you will. And so what the emperor Nero did is he was bugged because the Christians wouldn't bow down and worship him. And so he uh, tarred them and had them lit so that they would provide uh, light for his gardens at night. Christians were persecuted all over the empire. The whole book of Revelation is a ringing denunciation of this whole business that the emperor is God. In fact, all through the New Testament we see it, but we don't realize it. There's a phrase that occurs over and over in the New Testament. It is, Christ is Lord. And we hear that and we think, ah, Christ is Lord. That sounds like a nice, pious thought. In the Roman world, who was Lord? Caesar is Lord. Everyone was supposed to say that in acclamation. They would gather in the city square outside these temples like this one in Pergamon. And the people were to shout, Caesar is Lord. And the Christians refused to say it. And instead they said, Christ is Lord. It was insurrection. It was insubordination. A lot of them landed in jail because of it. Although I would add that when we think about Christianity and the ancient world, it's not just a matter of belief, and it's just not just a matter of not bowing down to a God that you think is not a God. There are also political and economic ramifications. As I mentioned the case in Ephesus, 
where the silversmiths got very upset about things. You also have Paul coming to, to Philippi in Acts chapter 16, and there's a slave girl who is a soothsayer, and it says that her owners made much profit because of her soothsaying. They come, they heal the woman. She can't do the soothsaying thing any longer. Who gets him, them thrown in jail? It's the owners of the slave girl. They prefer slavery, which boosts the economy and the nation over everything else. One of the things that should give us pause in this is that in the ancient world, the one true God was the state. Now, in America, we talk a lot about the separation of church and state, but I'm at least one of those people who gets a little bit nervous that in our country, the true God is the state. We're not very good at keeping this distinction in our head. So you have all these ideas that float around, right? Like uh, it's election time, and uh, you have people running for office, and they've shown no proclivity for God or much of anything else that's religious. But then when it's election time, what do they do? They show up at church, they have the photo op with the clergy, and if you, but try, the, try this, uh, go down to Union County, and try to run for public office saying, I'm an atheist. Or try to come to Mecklenburg County and say, I'm running for public office, I'm a Muslim. I've got this thing. To be patriotic seems to be close to being religious. And we still get the civil religion thing going on. Something to think about. Christianity comes along and demands a choice. And once it demands that choice, Christianity is very hard for the Christians economically and socially. But amazingly enough, Christianity grows. This is the most startling thing. Christians were persecuted. Uh, it was very hard to be a Christian. It wasn't uh, innocuous like it is here. Oh, I'm a member of Myers Park Methodist Church. <laughs> Who cares about that, right? Uh, in those days, if you said, I'm a member of a church, you could lose your life. You probably would lose your job. There are business deals that you couldn't make. One of the reasons you couldn't make the business deals was what? The bank was in the temple to the goddess Artemis, and you wouldn't go in there and break bread over a religious ceremony with what you believed was a false god. But Christianity grows, it's incredible. Like we, we sometimes people today worry about Christianity being, becoming a minority religion. Uh, look how well it did when it was really a minority religion, right? In the year 100, who knows these things, right? Sociologists calculate this, and they've got to be right. Uh, in the year 100, they think there were 8,000 Christians in the world. And that was 0.01% of the population. That's not 1% of the population. That's one hundredth of, like if you knew a Christian, that would be so weird. One hundredth of 1% 1 of the population. And you could lose your life for being in that group. Fifty years later, though, there are five times as many Christians. And they're now 0.07% of the population. A hundred years later, there are a million Christians in the world. Still only 2%. But you probably know a few by then. And by the year 350, there are 31 million Christians in the Roman world, 50% of the population. Now, the question that we could ask is, what made Christianity grow? And that's a complex question. Why did people begin to choose Christianity over these other religions that were tolerant, that were infinitely roomy? Why did they choose the religion that said, you got to be this, and you got to give up these other things. And there are probably a lot of bad reasons that are mixed in, but I suspect that there were some wonderful things about Christianity that appealed to real people, that spoke to real people. Uh, something I'm trying to think about in my email series is to ask the question that's an important one to ask, what's special about Christianity? And the reason that I ask that is that sometimes I think in the modern world we think all, all religious thinking must be good. If someone is spiritual, that must be a great, what was it, uh, President Eisenhower said, uh, I don't care what a man believes as long as he's sincere about it. And let me suggest this is the most dangerous thinking possible. Uh, David Koresh and the Branch Davidians were extremely sincere about their religion in Waco, Texas, and it cost much life. We're going to talk all about Islam as this series goes along, but you see some Muslims who are very sincere about their faith, but it's a misguided mistake on Islam with deadly results. So how do we think about what is valid? What is a true way of thinking about God? What are some false ways of thinking about God? What's a helpful way of thinking about God? What is constructive for human life versus what is destructive for human life? 
Uh, and as I've been thinking about it, I think there are four things that are special about early Christianity that we see growing out of the Bible's relationship to other religions. Uh, the first is this. What we find in the New Testament is what everyone in the ancient world would have thought of as absolutely absurd, and that is this idea that God became flesh. First of all, it's impossible. God, by definition, is everywhere, so how can God be just one place? God is omnipotent, but if there's one thing an infant is not, it would be omnipotent. Jesus hanging on the cross does not look very omnipotent. That's not an all-powerful God that lets himself be crucified. So Christians have this peculiar message that God came to a poor family with nothing and became vulnerable, and God did that so that we would know God. John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And there's a lot that's in that for us to contemplate, but what, part of what it is about, I think, is that God said, I want them to know me. I want them to love me. It's hard to love an ineffable God that is so transcendent and so remote. You can never have a personal relationship. God wanted to have a personal relationship, so God was even greater than being omnipotent, even greater than being omnipresent, greater than being infinite and ineffable. God came down in the form of what every one of us in this room has been. If God came down as a tall person, like short people would feel left out. If God came down as a father, those who never had children would be left out. But God came as an infant, which is what all of us have been. And infants do something special, I think. They do evoke in all but just the sickest people a kind of tenderness, a kind of love. Big, rough, gruff people become very gentle when they coo and their calloused hands become like pillows when they reach out to hold an infant. God wants to reach that part of us. And then that same God becoming flesh, this is what Paul says is the scandal. It's the reason that people reject Christianity, is that that God also died. That God, Jesus, let himself be crucified. So great was his commitment to love us, to care for us, to bring mercy to us. That does not look like God hanging on the cross, but yet according to the New Testament, oddly, among all religions that have ever existed, we say in that, in that cross, we see the very heart of God. We see the love of God. We see the compassion of God. We see a God who would not let us die or suffer alone, but anytime we suffer, that is a suffering that God knows from the inside. And that means that we have a religion, I think, that can cope with suffering. I have a friend named Rick Lisher who teaches at Duke Divinity School, and his son Adam uh, died of cancer uh, a number of years ago, and Rick's written a beautiful book about it. He says one of the things that struck him is that they went into a church right after his son was diagnosed with this inoperable cancer. And his wife was pregnant, and they could not be more distraught. They went into the church. It was a Catholic church, and in that church there was a crucifix that was hanging above the entrance. And they stopped, and they looked up, and they saw the suffering young man, Jesus, on a cross. And Rick said, you know, we, we knew we'd come to the right place because this is a church that says we can deal with this. We're not afraid of this. We're not squeamish about this. A uh, second thing that's peculiar, I don't know that this is absolutely right with respect to all religions, but it is, it is right with respect to the major religions of the world, is that uniquely in Christianity, we believe that we are saved by the grace of God. One of the most striking moments that I've ever had in this room was when I had Rabbi Murray Ezring. He's going to be back. And we were talking up here, and we basically came down to what is a fundamental difference in terms of salvation between Judaism and Christianity. He said, if you're Jewish, it depends on what you do. Do you keep the commandments? Do you do enough good in your life? And I said, for Christians, like, we want to do good. We want to obey the commandments. We want to do what God wants us to do. But at the end of the day, we're saved by the grace 
of God. It's a striking difference. And the fact is, Christians aren't that good at parsing the grace of God. We still really do believe in a works righteousness. We believe that we earn our way. A lot of times around here in the church, somebody will die, and I'll hear the chatter in the hallway, and somebody will say, oh, if anybody deserved to go to heaven, it was old Bob. Well, Bob was a wonderful guy, but it's not his goodness that saved him. It's the love and mercy of God. And the case that I would make for that is it is a dangerous way of thinking about, God, about grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer told, ta- taught us that there's such a thing as cheap grace that we say, God, I'm saved by God's grace. doesn't matter what I do. And if we think that, we don't really get grace, right? If we're sort of presuming upon an indulgent God, therefore I can do what I want because I'm saved by grace. He said, that's a cheap grace. You don't really get the grace. It would be as if I said, my wife Lisa loves me unconditionally. Therefore, I'm going to be a total bum because I don't ask her how I'm doing with this. Uh, to, I can say I'd be a total bum because she loves me unconditionally. If I get the fact of her love, that makes me want to be good. It makes me want to strive to be as good a husband as possible. But at the end of the day, what I know I need in my soul is some grace and some mercy. I don't think this is too hard to think about. Like You know you need mercy. And you know you can't get it just anywhere, right? I don't know where you work, but I don't know if you get any mercy at work. If you do, I'd be shocked. Like, oh, they're merciful to the salespeople. If you don't sell, oh, they're all mercy on you. There's just not a lot of mercy. There's not a lot of mercy in a lot of our even families and neighborhoods. But we all really need some mercy. This whole business of the grace of God, that's peculiar to Christianity. There's another thing that was very odd in the ancient world, and that is that Christianity touched off a social revolution. Uh, Paul writes these letters to the Christians in Corinth. They had a problem in Corinth. Uh, Most places early on, people who became Christians were poor. So you just had poor people, and it wasn't a big issue. But for some reason, when Christianity came to Corinth, there were some wealthy people that were converted to Christianity, so we had rich and poor. This was interesting, because in Corinth, rich and poor never befriended one another. It's a little bit like Charlotte, you know. Rich and poor just didn't hang out. Rich people like to hang out with other rich people. And poor people were comfortable hanging out with other poor people. And they just they didn't know how to be in houses together. They didn't know how to eat to get together. So Paul wrote that they were having a meal at, at one of the homes, and the Christians were coming. And what happened is the, the, the rich people, they didn't have to work late in the day. They could get off when they felt like it. They showed up early, and they, they ate all the food. And then the poor people who had to work late in the day came late, and there was no food left. And they couldn't get inside because the rich people had the nice seats inside. The rich poor people had to sit outside. Paul said, like, you're not getting it. Christianity is a social revolution. It's not about rich and poor. It's about the crossing of all of these boundaries. So the other, we were recently invited to think about Martin Luther King's speech where he envisioned a different kind of America where rich and poor and black and white and north and south sit down together at the table of brotherhood. That's just an inherent in the heart of Christianity is that, and this is hard for us, we don't do very well with this, but it's in the heart of Christianity that we loathe social division. The idea of any kind of caste, that should be anathema to Christians. And it's one of the things that betrays us, I think, is that we pretty much mirror the rest of society. We haven't grown very far in that just yet. Fourth thing about Christianity early on that was interesting, it begins in the book of Acts and extends through the early centuries. Late in the second century, <clears throat> there's a church leader in Turkey named Tertullian. <laughs> he was explaining why Christianity was growing so much in Asia Minor. He says, it is our care of the helpless, our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of our opponents. They say, see how they love right? It was not that the Christians had better ideas, although I think we have some pretty cool ideas. What was striking in the ancient world was the love that Christians exercise. And it's very important to measure the kind of love that they're talking about. Tertullian says, it is our care of the helpless. He's not saying it's the kind of love that when we get together with people that are like us at church, we just really love each other so much. We just, we just, we just love each other so much. I, I love Bob Johnson. He's such a great guy. And he's sitting there with, with Jer- I love Jerry Brady too. We just love it. No, this, they loved the helpless. They loved the people who were not Christian. 
uh, one, of the, one of the complaints is, uh, you know, Constantine came along and made the empire Christian, uh, but then two emperors after that, Julian, the apostate, said, we're through with this Christianity stuff in the empire. We're going to go back to being pagans again. So he tried to make the empire pagan uh, once more, but he had a complaint because the Christians were making this hard to pull off. And here's what he says. Those impious Christians support not only their own poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that our poor people lack aid from us. Like the Roman Empire looked bad because they had all these citizens that were in need, and the Roman Empire didn't do anything for them. The sentiment in the world in those days is you were not supposed to help poor people. If they were poor, it was their own problem. And you leave them to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. This is what you do with people that are in need. You don't help them. If you help them, they'll become dependent. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> if you don't help them, they will become dependent on you. The Christians went out and they, it's, the world was changing. A little bit like our world. The world is becoming more urban. Once upon a time, the world was very rural. This used to apply in the United States of America. I talked before about my father growing up in the little town of Oakboro, North Carolina. Everybody took care of everybody else. When I was a little boy, I remember across the street, a house burned down. And the next day, all the men of Oakboro came, and they were clearing the lot, and they were out there hammering, and they rebuilt the guy's house. And we said, that's how we ought to take care of problems in the world. That would have worked fine if you hadn't had the Industrial Revolution and millions of people hadn't moved to cities where you just couldn't manage all this stuff, Right? That was going on in the ancient world. People were moving into cities. There were massive urban problems, and people couldn't get any help. They were cut off from their families because of urbanization, changing economy. And the Christians tackled the problems of the day in the cities. They dealt with real issues. They appealed to all people. When people were burned out of their homes, they tried to help them. When there were orphans and widows, instead of just abandoning them, they took them into their own homes. They fed them. They offered the best they could of medical care, although medical care wasn't very good in those days. They tried to cope with suffering for all people, and therefore they looked really weird in the ancient world. And the comment over and over that pagans made was, see how they love. Now, to try to wind this up, if love won the day for the early Christians, then maybe love is the way we need to think about other religions in our day, right? Think about the religions of the world, and there are a lot of them, and the number of interesting things that we could say about other religions. One is we have an awful lot in common, right? Like Christians aren't the only people who think you ought to be honest. We're not the only ones who think adultery is really a bad idea. We're not the only ones who say that you shouldn't murder people. We're not the only people who think that freedom is a good idea. There's a lot that we share in common with other religions. Even some of our sacred stories, I remember when I was in college, I took a like, religion 101 class, and uh, the professor was one of these guys who enjoyed kind of dinging fundamentalists and, and making them just apoplectic. And uh, so he would kind of debunk everything they had learned in Sunday school. And I remember him talking about flood stories among the other cultures of the world. The Babylonians had a flood story, and the Persians had a flood story, and the Indians had a flood story. And, all the, the medians had a flood, all, all over the place, there were, there were flood stories. He said, this shows that clearly there's not a flood. And people were jumping out of the windows, all upset. <laughs> the Southern Baptists, you know, I'm kidding. And um, I didn't say anything because I was too shy at the time. But I sat there thinking, well, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, that if we're talking about a flood of gargantuan proportions, you would expect that people all over the world would have some kind of a story about it. So to me, that wasn't saying like there wasn't a flood, but it was like, this is something that we have in common with a lot of people. I thought that was interesting. Uh, we have a lot in common, but Christians are in a funny place. Um, the guy that I talked to the other day, he said, I could do your lecture in one minute. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I said, well, what, what would you do with that for people of other religions? He said, well, tell them that, see if they believe it or not. This is really effective. Um, <laughs> not personally tried it. Uh, one of the reasons it's not effective and that we can't just go do that nowadays is that a lot of stuff's happened in the course of history. Uh, for instance, the Holocaust happened. Uh, you know, um, I have a friend who knows that uh, Rabbi Murray Ezring is a close friend of mine. And he said, like, why don't you try to make him Christian? It's hard, it's hard to get Jews to be Christians. 
you know, and one of the reasons is there are people living in Charlotte, North Carolina today who survived the Holocaust. There's a woman when she was a little girl, I love her story. Her parents just were desperate, they didn't know what to do, so they put her in a potato sack and just threw her in the back of a truck that was ambling down a road, just hoped for the best. It drove across the border somehow, she lives in Charlotte now. Her parents were killed, her older brother was killed. They had neighbors of yours who had friends, family, that were killed, and the people who killed them, like we go, they're Nazis. Well, they were Lutherans. They were Catholics. They were people that went to church. The leaders of those church bodies stood behind Hitler and said, Heil Hitler. It's been a long history of violence and intolerance, and it seems to me that Christians, when we think about other religions, it's a good time to be humble. It's a very good time to be humble. It's a good time to be in listening mode. It's a good time to be aware that sometimes what we do, this, this happens within the Bible, I think, is that if you think about Israelites, there's some Israelites that are like, they're really good at being Israelites, and the other Israelites who, they're terrible at being Israelites, right? And if you look at Jesus' disciples, they're like, they're terrible at following Jesus. And they're like the ones that knew him best. So it's interesting that in every religion you have like, the good, faithful, noble ones that kind of get it, and then you have the ones who are like, oh, they just are missing it so badly. We need to think about that with every religion. We would not want Christianity to be, to be measured by our worst representatives. Like if somebody said to me, I hate Christianity because those Klansmen that uh, lynched black people in Mississippi were Christians. I'd say, oh, that's not fair, that's not fair, we have good Christians. That would be unfair. We do this with other religions um, as well, don't we? So, thinking about other religions, one of the things that we want to do is we want to listen and learn. Uh, Rabbi Ezra is coming back. I hate to share the stage with him. He's always like so brilliant and funny, and I'm like Bleh, next to him. He's great to listen to. And uh, he's going to come back uh, in two weeks, and I'm going to ask him kind of what's special about Christianity. I'm like, what do you think's cool about us? What do you think's like abysmal about us? From your perspective, what's special about Christianity? That'll be pretty interesting. The other question though will be, what does Judaism have that we don't have that we could learn from? Or more importantly, what does Judaism have that we ought to have that we have forgotten that we have? That's the great question, right? We'll talk about that. Uh, and then uh, in October, uh, the um, Muslim imam, John Ederer, is going to be with us. This is, uh, he, John spoke at the Mecklenburg Ministries uh, interfaith service last year. I got emotional. I was really touched. They asked him, they said, who in the entire city would you want to introduce you? And he asked me if I would introduce him in that room. I was honored to do so. This is right before he stood up uh, to talk. He's going to come and talk about Islam. And there's a lot of confused thinking about Islam. There's a lot that's terrible in Islam. Like there's a lot that's terrible in Christianity. There's a lot that's wonderful in Islam that we can learn from. Uh, I'll just tell you, I've told some of you this one story, but I'll pass it on again. When Will, Will, when Will Willimon was the dean of the Duke Chapel, he's doing campus ministry at Duke. And uh, he uh, had a Muslim student who came to him and said, uh, why don't the Christian students ever pray? It, Will had to process that for a minute, then he thought, this guy carries a rug around in his backpack, and when the appointed hour comes, whatever he's doing, if he's in the library, if he's playing soccer, if he's in a class, he stops and he rolls that rug and he says a prayer. And you and I would say, well, you've got to keep playing soccer, and you've got to be doing your homework, so you'll pray some other time. But he said, why don't the Christians, he never saw Christian students, like, praying. That's kind of interesting. Uh, I would commend to you a wonderful book by Jonathan Sachs called The Dignity of Difference. It's a short read. It's an eloquent book. He talks about difference and how there's a great dignity in that, and there's so much to be learned. We're enriched not when we are fearful of differences, but when we can embrace that. There's another book I wouldn't recommend to you, but I'll just tell you what it says. Paul Griffiths, who teaches at Duke Divinity School, wrote a book called An Apology for Apologetics. And in it, he talks about how do we talk to people of other religions. He says, so often we make the mistake of, of like, well, not talking. That's one mistake that we make. Another is uh, we talk and say, we're really the same, aren't we? 
I mean, if you've been to any of these things that Murray Ezring and I do, I hope part of what you like about it is that we never say, oh, we really believe the same thing. You know, I remember somebody asked about the virgin birth downstairs one time. Oh, my goodness. He thinks that's just a very dumb idea. It was cool. It was great. And so what Paul says is that we do talk, we don't minimize our differences, but we also are humble and in listening mode, and we're always willing to admit, admit that even within our own religion, when we listen to somebody of another religion, there might be something in our own religion that just maybe we, we got it wrong. And because of that conversation, we learn something about our own faith that we didn't know before, and we correct something that we weren't thinking rightly about with respect to our own faith. Um, We make the best case that we can for our own faith, but then we're interested also in what about people of other faiths? Because Christianity came along during New Testament times and said you need to become Christian, that there is truth. Not everything is true. So what do we do with people who believe differently? Uh, C.S. Lewis, a great, great, wonderful writer, um, died the same day as John F. Kennedy, so didn't get much press because of that. A great writer of children's books and so on, wrote a book called Mere Christianity that uh, had a big impact on me when I was in college and lots of people over time. It still speaks after all these years. It's amazing, Mere Christianity. It's something he wrote in Mere Christianity that I didn't pay attention to when I first read it, but I've gone back to it and have pondered it. Uh, And I want to close with uh, this. C.S. Lewis said, the truth is God has not told us what his arrangements about other people are. This is interesting. Like the New Testament doesn't really say, all right, here's what I'm going to do to the Muslims, and here's what I'm, it's just not in there, right? Somebody called me about an hour before this program and said, I want you to talk about the Muslims tonight. I said, it's, it's the Bible. It doesn't say anything about the Muslims. The truth is, God has not told us what his arrangements about other people are. We do know that no man can be saved except through Christ. We do not know that only those who know him can be saved through him. This requires some thinking. Uh, I I don't know what I believed about God growing up. I had a kind of mixed upbringing and went to my grandparents' Baptist church, where I think the message probably was, if you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. And I went off to college, like a lot of people go off to college, (laughs) and you start wondering about all these things. And since I didn't have a deep church upbringing, I wasn't as troubled by the questions. But I remember being in the dorm down, you know, late at night, and people would bring up these questions. I know we would always ask, you know, well, what about the people in Mongolia? I don't know why we choose Mongolia. I guess that sounded like a really obscure place where people wouldn't have heard of of Jesus. What about the people who have never heard of Jesus? It's a good question. I did a YouTube on this that's a saying about what I'm about to say to you, but I'll repeat it now because I think it's important. I'm less interested in people in Mongolia who are Taoist or Buddhist or something and have never heard about Jesus. Uh, I'm more interested in people closer to home who don't believe in Jesus because, um, gosh, all they've heard about it is from kind of mean, judgmental people. Or all they've heard about Christianity is from vapid, boring people who say, oh, you got to be Christian, and it's, there's no trace of a positive impact being on their life, right? But they say, you got to believe this, and they must ask, like, why bother? That seems so innocuous. It's so nothing. Why would you have to believe such a thing? You're just like everybody else. You go to work, there's no trace of this in your life. Or my parade example, and I've brought her up before, but I'll bring her up again. I was counseling with a woman a number of years ago, and she did not believe in Jesus, and she will never believe in Jesus, I don't think. Uh, and the reason is she was raised by a man who was a super devout Christian. He was a Sunday school teacher and uh, kind of a traveling preacher, and was just, he was just a super pious guy indeed. And he just said, you got to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. But the thing was that this guy, through her childhood and her adolescence, was sexually abusing her. And so she didn't want to have anything to do with her daddy's religion. And it's an interesting case because you have to ask, well, who, who's saved? Because the dad, the abuser, he believed in Jesus. He said all the right things. He read his Bible, sat in a pew every Sunday, sang the hymns. You know, he'd accepted Christ. 
And then here's a woman who rejects Christ. I mean, from what we know about God from the Scriptures, I would say that if anybody gets saved out of those two, I don't know, maybe it's the daughter. Jesus said to have a heart for those kinds of people that were beaten down, downtrodden by everybody else. Jesus says this thing in John chapter 14. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. A lot of people pull that out, and it just gets them so excited, and it sounds like, you know, Jesus is giving a lecture on Christianity and other religions, and he's settling the question for all time there in just one verse. I think we need to remember when Jesus said this, and Jesus said this, he was sitting at dinner, it wasn't a lecture hall, he was at dinner with his closest friends, and he was about to go into the night and be arrested and be killed. And so he's not, I don't think, giving an intellectual lecture. I think he is, in a somber way, giving them some hope, even though they're about to lose him, even though he's about to be executed, and they're even going to wind up running away from him. They're not even going to stick with him. I think Jesus, in an inviting, you can't get tone to tone from the Bible, right? It's like when you get an email from somebody, like you don't know what the tone is. It's hard to get tone from the Bible. It's Jesus saying, I am the way. That just doesn't feel right for that dinner to me. To me, it feels like Jesus is saying, like, I'm, I'm the way. There's, there's a way. There's hope. There's good. There's life. If you stick with me, there's a lot of good that comes from that. So the question I want to think about is the one that C.S. Lewis raises, which is, can, I mean, we could say all religions are equally valid ways to God. Well, that doesn't work very well, because some religions, like we said, David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, that's like an evil religion, so they're like, that's not good. But then if we say all religions are the same way to God, those religions themselves don't accept each other. I mean, you're either saved by works or you're saved by grace, or so they mutually exclude each other. So what do we do? And I want to think if there's not a way to say Jesus is the way, but that Jesus might also be the way for someone like the woman I was talking to who doesn't accept him because of her father? Or is there a way that Jesus could be the way for people who don't know him? Or could Jesus be the way for people of other religions who don't accept him, don't have much of a chance to accept him? And I like to think that there are a lot of ways that actually we're beneficiaries of things we don't know anything about and didn't ask for. Two examples that I think of often. One is my children. Uh, When they were very young, uh, they'd cry in the middle of the night, maybe have a fever or whatever. You know, they didn't say, "Uh, Dad, will you come? I will accept your help, Father, if you will come and help me. They just screamed, and I picked them up, and they didn't even seem to know that I was doing anything for them. They didn't seem to look at me. They didn't, you know, nod with approval. And when I put them back in the bed at night, they didn't say, thank you, Father, so much for that. They didn't ask for it. They don't remember it, but they were the beneficiaries of it. They were blessed by something they didn't understand and didn't ask for. Or sometimes I think about anonymous givers. Anonymous givers sometimes create big institutions and great things that bless other people. Nobody asked them to do that. Nobody knows they did it. No one can thank them. No one can believe in them or think that they had a great cause, but yet they're still beneficiaries in this way. Uh, One of my favorite books on this matter is by a Roman Catholic theologian named Hans Urs von Balthasar. And the title of his book really captures it all. (laughs) He asks, dare we hope that all men, it's not a great title, is it? Like he excludes the women, but dare we hope that all men will be saved? And what he says in this book is that the proper Christian disposition is one, to realize like this isn't in our purview to make this decision about other people. God doesn't ask us to do it. We're not going to be any good at it. There's no use spending any energy on determining the salvation of other people. He says what is incumbent upon us is that we hope every person is saved. So I could never say, you know, well, you know, Betsy Baker, she, no, she shouldn't be in. You never do that. And no matter who it is you hope i've said this before and people said well how about saddam hussein or someone 
I don't know, I mean, how, how are we going to make these distinctions, right? Like, so-and-so is so horrible that we don't hope for their salvation. I mean, I hope for my own salvation. I'm a broken person that doesn't serve God well. We're all broken. We're all sinners. We're all lost. So von Balthasar says that we hope for the salvation, you know, of every person. Uh, and that's something that works um, well in my mind. And I think it's a very New Testamentish, new, very Old Testamentish way of thinking about things. First believers found themselves among a multitude of religions, and the best thing that they did was that they loved, and loving people hope, uh, and so on. Okay, thank you. You've been very patient for coming tonight.